Hi everyone, my name is Dr Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics and what is known as the Access Fellow here at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. Now, when people are thinking of applying to universities like Oxford, and we have Access events on in this college about three or four times a week. So we're constantly talking to prospective students. One of my most common pieces of advice to everyone if they want to apply to the university is to start thinking much more childishly because I literally train my Oxford undergraduate students to think more like a sort of five, six-year-old child. And I'm constantly inspired in this endeavour by my own six-year-old son, Teddy, because he has the sorts of thinking skills that I want my Oxford students to have. Specifically, he doesn't assume he knows anything. In fact, he's quite happy to accept that he doesn't know much at all. And so he's constantly asking the best questions you can possibly imagine. And you would have done it yourself, and you may have siblings of around that age. And as we get a bit older, we start to feel a bit embarrassed asking these sorts of questions, and so we stop doing it. But that is such a terrible shame. So just as a few examples, Teddy asked me the evergreen, why is the sky blue, which is an absolute stone cold classic but he also asked me why is gold yellow most metals are silver which is a good question uh he also asked me why does metal sometimes smell I had to look that one up uh he even asked me does your phone get heavier when you take photos with it i mean these are just great questions and it comes from that sort of childlike wonder about the world and the universe around us and it's so powerful, it's incredibly powerful because he just notices more stuff that adults and older children just get a bit bored and glaze over and ignore or they're just so quickly trying to navigate the world they just miss all of these incredible details that are right in front of their eyes. So having that sort of capacity to think more like a child is genuinely powerful and certainly will help you in any application to university. So what I've decided to do in this video is to go through a few childish questions of my own, which I've sort of had inspired by Teddy, and go through them in order to not only think through some interesting questions, but also to explain how thinking like a child can help you be a better thinker and hopefully make us all feel a little bit better about ourselves because these questions will help us reveal just how incredible we are as human beings. Okay, so let's get started. Now I'm half blind, so I'm gonna to have to wear these slightly tinted glasses, so uh, just bear with me on that. Okay, so first of all, first childish question, what are you? <laughs> what are you? Uh, not in the sort of classic sense of small talk, like what's your, what's your occupation? What are, what are you doing? Um, but in the sort of sense of like literally, what, what are you? What makes you up? Um, I mean, so talking about seven octillion atoms, which is just a number too huge to fathom, 30 trillion cells, human cells, and about 39 trillion microbial cells. So, you know, there's more bacteria and various other things in terms of the sheer number of cells in you than there are human cells, which is pretty interesting. Um, in terms of what are you, I mean, does that sort of physical matter matter? If you can excuse that pun. I mean, no, not really. The DNA, the, the code, the software is much more important, I would argue, than the hardware, the physical stuff that makes you up. And that DNA is in each of those 30 trillion cells. And indeed, a strand of DNA in each cell is a meter long, roughly. So if you were to lay all of your DNA end to end, it would go from here to past Pluto, which is pretty astonishing. So that raises another question, which is how old are you? Now, I suppose the classic sort of way of customarily thinking about this is counting the number of birthdays you have, which is you know, fine and, and acceptable for most conversations. <laughs> but in a childlike mind, thinking about how old you are would raise the question of how much of the stuff that you have with you now, the physical stuff that makes you up, were you born with? To which the answer is not much, really not much. So you're born with some of the brain cells that you have now, you're born with some eye cells that you have now, you're born with some bone cells that you have now. If you're a woman, you'll be born with your eggs and you may still have many of those now as well. But otherwise, pretty much everything, and by pretty much I mean actually literally everything, gets replaced and replenished in a cycle that lasts at most seven years. So in terms of your physical matter, you're at most seven years old. And I can say that with confidence regardless of how old you are are according to your birth certificate. Okay, I mean, to put it in a sort of specific, a million new red blood cells have just been created in your body in the time between those two clicks. 
which is just insane, right? But wonderful as well. And I think it sort of forces us to recognise that our matter doesn't matter so much. It's not the hardware that makes us human, it's the software, it's the DNA. And that we pass on to, you know, our offspring or we share with our siblings. And it's therefore in a sort of non-trivial sense kind of immortal, which is reassuring in many instances. Okay, what makes those cells alive? Well, no one knows. <laughs> you know, cells are kind of little bags of biochemistry that happen to perform all sorts of incredibly useful well, necessary functions. And we're not entirely sure how that little bag of biochemistry is alive, as opposed to just an inert bag of chemistry. It's just not known, which is pretty cool. So have a think about it, see what you, see what you come up with. And just be comfortable with that sort of not knowing, because it's, it's healthy, we don't know everything. Uh, where are you? Now, you, again, sort of customarily might sort of say a specific location on the earth, which is Totally reasonable when you're dealing with small talk, but it's not reasonable when you're dealing with a five-year-old or a six-year-old child. So where am I right now? Well, okay, so at my latitude, so I'm in, in Oxford in, in the UK, uh, I'm moving at about 650 miles an hour. Um, the Earth, of course, is moving around the sun at about 67,000 miles an hour. And the entire solar system is barreling towards the constellation of Leo at about 872,406 miles an hour. So, you're never realistically ever fixed in space-time and there's no such place as here. So, where am I? It doesn't matter, because there, <laughs> there is no fixed location. I mean, for ease, I'll say I'm in Oxford, but that doesn't make a huge amount of sense in, uh, in terms of physics, which again, you know, like a child, I'm, I'm willing to sort of, rather than be too freaked out, I'm willing to take that as kind of interesting and, you know, uh, uh, lesser thought about. How energetic do you feel? I mean, this can be tricky, it depends on the time of day and depends on what you've eaten and all sorts of other variables. Um, but what about the most famous equation in human history, which of course is E equals MC squared, how can we use that to estimate the energy in our stuff, our matter? Well, we can plug in all of the, all of the numbers, can't we? So if E equals MC squared, well E is, stands for energy, M is mass in kilograms, and C is the speed of light. So your energy in joules is equal to your mass in kilograms multiplied by the speed of light in meters per second squared, which is an enormous number. So let's say, for sake of argument, that you're 50 kilograms. I'm definitely not 50 kilograms, but it makes the maths a bit easier, so let's just go with it. Um, so a 50 kilogram person would have energy in joules, which would be 50 multiplied by 9 times 10 to the 16 joules, which is the speed of light squared, uh, which is equivalent uh, to 1 ton, uh, sorry, which is equivalent to 9 billion uh, joules. Uh, no, sorry, I'm getting this all wrong, which is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the 18 joules, an even bigger number. Uh, just for sort of sake of comparison, one tonne of TNT is 9 billion joules, and therefore in a 50 kilogram human being, uh, there are roughly uh, over 1 billion tonnes of TNT worth of energy potential, which is 1,000 megatons, uh, which is 10 times Tsar Bomba, which is the largest thermonuclear device ever detonated. <laughs> now this obviously seems sort of slightly ridiculous, but according to Einstein's equation of E equals mc squared, a 50 kilogram person in all of their atoms and all of their stuff has sort of locked in the energy of the universe equivalent to 10 times the most powerful thermonuclear device in human history. Which again, perhaps doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's pretty cool to think about. I think it is anyway. Um, when are you? So this is another slightly sort of old childish question, again to which the answer would be whatever time it says on your watch or your phone or whatever. Um, but do me a favour, clap in front of your face uh, and then have a think about what just happened there. So when you clap, of course light travelling ever so, well not ever so, much faster than sound, um, the, 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 the seeing of the clap will happen momentarily before the hearing of the clap. But in sort of biomechanical terms, actually the signals going into your ears and through into your brain uh, arrive ever so slightly before the signals that go through your optic nerve end up in the occipital lobe and therefore seeing the visual image. In other words, you 
hear the clap before you see the clap, but with a tiny, tiny difference. But nonetheless, a difference. And in order to make sure that it's all stitched together seamlessly, your brain puts you outside of the present tense by roughly one two hundredths of a second. So when are you? You are one two hundredths of a second outside of now because your brain is in real time stitching together all of the inputs to have it completely perfect and seamless, which is kind of freaky, but also kind of mind blowing how much our brain is doing like a permanently running editing suite of software, just stitching together all of the inputs so that they are perfectly in tune. It's amazing. And your brain really is amazing. And this is worth dwelling on. Your brain is the most amazing thing in the universe, I would argue. And indeed, it's the only thing which has ever, as far as we're aware, pondered anything about the universe. And of course, it's the only thing to have ever named itself. Um, so let's sort of dig into it a little bit further. I mean, the memory capacity of a human brain is two and a half petabytes, which is over two and a half thousand terabytes or about 40,000 64 gig smartphones. I mean, it sort of seems slightly odd to imagine that your brain could be 40,000 iPhones worth of memory and processing. But bear in mind that, you know, a good 95% of your thinking uh, is unconscious, so you're not even aware of it. And stuff like, you know, stitching together in real time all of the inputs. And the very fact that, you know, the universe is not colour, it doesn't come in colour. Colours are produced in your brain. So you're the only organism that will ever see the universe in the palette of colours that you see it which I think is beautiful. I mean, lots of people get sort of absolutely terrified by that because they think, oh, you know, how can that all just be down to me? And of course, you know, the way we perceive colour and sound and all sorts of other inputs will be very similar to each other, but they're still unique. And I think that's kind of beautiful, personally. But tell me what you think. I hope you're not too scared by that. So the ultimate sort of childish question is that given how just mind-bogglingly, insanely amazing you are and how incredible the brain is that you've got squashed between your ears, uh, what's holding you back? Now this sounds like a sort of really sort of, I don't know, uh, mawkish sort of uh, bit of cheese to, to ask someone, you know, oh, you know, what's holding you back? This, this doesn't sound very British of me to, to ask such a, such a wholesome, earnest question. <laughs> but you know, Brits aren't all cynical, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> but what I really mean by this question is that I mean, I've, I've had a lifetime of, of sort of saying no to myself in many contexts and sort of saying, oh, you can't do that, you're not good enough for that, you're not clever enough, no one will want you to do that. Uh, and it's usually me sort of assessing quite inaccurately what I'm capable of. And I suspect a lot of people do that. And I, I think I'm just old enough and silly enough to start asking the ultimate childish question of why why do that why live like that why be so cruel to yourself it's not helpful and why does this have any relevance to people thinking of applying to universities like oxford well the most common reason people don't get in uh, despite their being able to apply and being eligible to apply is that they just don't take that step they don't think they're good enough and they say no to themselves. And even though they would have taken a huge amount from the application process and going through it and developing their brain and thinking more childishly and thinking about the wonder of the world and themselves, they just don't take them that step because there's that nagging voice inside their head that says, you're not good enough. But you have the same kit and caboodle as any other human being. And research is showing that what we call intelligence is to a very significant extent a function of choice rather than destiny or genetics. That we can do a lot more than we may think we're capable of. And actually, as I hope I've demonstrated with this video, one of the most important steps in doing more with your brain is having as much fun as possible. Doing and asking silly things in order to see what works. I mean, in the animal kingdom, play is the most commonly used mechanism for learning amongst you know, young members of any species. And I think the older members of species ought to do a bit more playing. And we can learn an awful lot from young children because they notice stuff that we just don't see even though it's right in front of our eyes. So please get used to asking more childish questions 
and please, for goodness sake, recognise how insanely amazing you are. Whoever you are, wherever you are on the planet, as a human being, you are just one of the most mind-bendingly incredible things that could ever have been conceived of. And, you know, congratulations to us. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments. All the best. Bye.